Yeah, I would like first of all to begin by uh, giving a very, very warm word of thanks, uh, especially to you students that are here with us today. And uh, I also, uh, I mean, without rhetoric, but I mean, I'm honestly and sincerely proud to be able to offer to you the panel this afternoon, because as you can see, the two colleagues and friends that are here, Gorana Ognjanovic and Jasna Joselic, I hope that I mean the pronunciation of their name bear some resemblance to the actuality of those names, that with me, I mean, it's not something to be uh, taken for granted. Um, at any rate, I would say that they combine in a way that is hard to find, uh, field research, passion and also intellectual lucidity and sophistication in the choice of interpretation tools. Therefore, I am truly, truly happy to present them. Uh, this panel, as you will see, it has to do about gender-based violence in the context of war and conflict, and in particular, it will address the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina. So this morning we were speaking about how domestic violence is not to be considered as a private matter, but is a problem uh, that is like the peak of an iceberg, uh, of an overall tension about the freedom and autonomy of women in modernity. The case of Bosnia-Herzegovina and the case of genocide somehow presents us these problems, let's say, rich large. Goran Ognjanovic is from the University of Oslo, and she also has a background in philosophy, not as NYU, but as they say, nobody's perfect, and so it's Colombia. Eh? <laughs> Some like it hot. Eh? Uh, instead, Jasna, Jasna Joselic, instead the background is in religious studies and um, uh, advisor at the Norwegian Center for Human Rights. Uh, besides this, I would like also to present them um, because they are very, very, very dear friends and so it is indeed a great joy for me to be able to uh, give you the possibility of listening. And so without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Goran and Yashna, I'm going on a first name, Quaker style, I hope you don't mind. Uh, as I said, I first will say a couple of words, and then I will present you with some statistics regarding the gender violence uh, during the, the wars and conflict. So I really hope that uh, we all here will understand the, how huge impact the gender-based violence actually has on entire society. So, in this presentation, I will focus on gender violence in context of war as a tool of war strategy. And for the purpose of annihilating specific group, and in this case, we're talking about nation. Rape and sexual violence was used as a weapon to desecrate women in effort to purify and exterminate entire nation. In the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, we're talking of Bosnian Muslims or Bosniaks as they identify themselves these days. In societies where women are considered as a property of men and nation's soul, sexual violence is proven as effective, powerful tool. Occupying the bloodline became synonymous with occupying the enemy's physical territory and national pride. Treat of rape and sexual violence create a sense of power for a perpetrator to undermine the foundation of a targeted nation affecting the victims in its destructive capacity. Since women are considered as essential symbol of nation, community, and family, systematic and calculated use of sexual violence in wartime is being seen as destruction of culture as well as, as a assault upon the national identity. The construction of cultural thought, the destructive act of rape breaks down nation, cultural and religious identities, and result in permanent national wound. In historical perspective, as we uh, as well hearing today, our uh, distinguished uh, presenters uh, say a little bit about it, Consider rape and other forms of sexual violence in conflict as sporadic and collateral damage of war. In modern days, unfortunately, rape and other forms of sexual violence have become a strategic weapon of war and terror. Sexual violence consists in 
purposefully action on which the intention is often to inflict severe humiliation on the victims and diminishing the human dignity. In the case where others are forced to watch acts of sexual violence, such acts aim to intimidating the large community. Unfortunately, we are witnessing the sexual violence and rape in the context of war and conflict is still a powerful tool. As we see in Sierra Leone, Rwanda, Liberia, Sudan, Uganda, Nigeria, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, just to mention some, where women, children, and men are daily exposed to sexual violence, rape, and sexual mutilation, unfortunately. And did we done something about it? No, I cannot say that. We're talking, that is a good start. Sexual violence and rape in war make strong strategy warfare. The military have used sexual violence and rape to remove people of a certain ethnic or religious group from one area, and in the case of Bosnia, that was the central strategy of the perpetrators. Hague Tribunal confirmed that rape was used as a systematic weapon of ethnic cleansing in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is precedence for prosecution exclusively for rape as a war crime. The military and paramilitary forces from Serbia and Bosnian Serbs used rape as a part of policy of terror and violence designed to achieve ethnic cleansing. The degradation and abuse of women were central to conquest the territory. So, we can say that evidence pointed, evidence that is found pointed to the rape and sexual abuse was, was associated with the so-called policy of ethnic cleansing by the Bosnian Serbs forces. What was the point? The point was that wanted area, talking about territory, wanted area, had to be ethnically homogenous. Multiple witnesses interviewed separately describe rape camps through Bosnia Serb controlled territory. So within the last two decades, however, there has been increasing interest in asymmetric meaning of sexual violence and rape together with aspects of war in case of Bosnia-Herzegovina related to identity, ethnic cleansing, or war rape. Systematic rape, the use of sexual violence, became a planned instrument of war policy where the majority of victims has been Bosnian Muslims and the majority of perpetrators have been Bosnian Serbs. And the victims of genocide were targeted based on their religious identity and the violence was grounded in religious mythology. Most rapes, uh, I, I really apologize, I get a little bit uh, excited to say uh, mildly because this is a very hard topic to talk about it. So most rapes conducted in connection with efforts to displace the civilian population of targeted ethnic groups from a particular area, as I mentioned earlier. There are testimonies confirming that military and camp commanders explicitly ordered their subordinates to commit act of sexual violence. As Alexandra Stigmeyer states, women in conflict zones are frequently raped to humiliate and degrade as a part of program to terrorize, to drive away the unwanted ethnic others, to boost the military's morale, to demoralize the males associated with the raped woman. Rape is regularly committed as a part of a broad, systematic, even strategic campaign to destroy a targeted group. And this destruction is explicitly or implicitly encouraged by authorities, sometimes even ordered. Children, young girls, adults, and elder, uh, elderly women were raped. Sexually violence and rape was targeting the body, the gender, religion, and psychic. The case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, however, presents a significant, more complex picture. Regarding victimhood, for instance, in some cases, family members were forced to rape one another or to witness a family member being raped. 
In Bosnia, Herzegovina rape was used to recreate the clear-cut distinction between intermingled groups, Serbs, Muslims, and Croats. Even though rape is often enforced up, uh, upon them by a third party, both victims and perpetrators find it difficult to face each other after the event. Selzman uh, defines ethnic cleansing as an act intended to render an area ethnically homogenized by removing members of given group through the use of concentration camps, torture, sexual violence, mass killings, forced deportation, destruction of private and cultural property, pillage and theft, and the blocking of humanitarian aid. So we can state that rape in Bosnia, and not just in Bosnia, but in other cases that I mentioned uh, earlier, had as its purpose to destroy an ethnic group in that sense by killing it, to prevent its reproduction, or to disorganizing, removing people from their home soil. Strategic rape attacks not only the victims, but also aims to dissolve the social structure of the attack groups. Rape victims considered to be Muslim and hence responsible for acts and deeds that took place over many centuries ago, and they were attributed to an Islamic nation. Another example is the setting should create a situation in which the enemy men were incapable of providing their manhood in protecting their women. Yet another example is that number of perceptions of what to consider pure or impure. Simply to avoid objected matter is of course the easiest way to retain purity. And if pollution should occur, a vast number of cleansing rites are to be found. Of those, sacrifice is the most common. So as I said, the sexual violence has enormous impact on Bosnian society. And as I said, I will show you just uh, some statistic uh, that prove, proving exact my uh, thesis. So I will ask my colleague, uh, Ognjenovic, just to... Uh, the first of all, I will start with the census of Bosnia-Herzegovina and compare it uh, before the war and after the war. So census done in 1991, that was uh, prior to the war, Population of um, the Bosnia and Herzegovina was around 4.4 million people, and we have the three main uh, ethnic, as they call it, national groups: is Bosnian Muslims, today Bosniaks, Bosnian Orthodox, uh, today Serbs, and Bosnian Catholics, today Croats. And we had category others. And in that category, as you can see, is uh, <laughs> representatives of other groups as they have been. Uh, legally adopted. So, as you can see, the first two groups, Yugoslavs and Bosnians, are as well legally adopted as the ethnic group. It's contradictory because we have the state with the name Bosnia-Herzegovina, but in the same time legally is not adopted the nation of Bosnians. So please, the second. So here you have the, the, the pie with the percentage of population and uh, uh, as I said, uh, prior uh, the war. Please, next. And here we have census Bosnia-Herzegovina 2013. This census uh, was really uh, a huge issue uh, because the census was uh, formally accepted uh, in 2016 in November because uh, many sites in the conflict are especially Serbian Croatia that was occupying the Bosnia-Herzegovina had uh, uh, difficulties to accept that because that was the proof of results of war in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So as you see, the population today is like 3.5 uh, 3 million people. So comparing with 91, there is like 845 less where they are. So here you see uh, the pie of percentage of populations today, and we have majority over 50% of Bosnian Muslims, Bosniaks, and 30-some uh, percent of Bosnian Serbs. As I pointed earlier, that uh, sexual violence and rape has been used in the conflict, not just against the women, we have to be clear, because unfortunately many male 
Mills was the victim of sexual violence, and especially in the concentration camps and prisons. Uh, here you can see the ethnic distribution before and after the war. If you, say the if you see the first pictures, you can see that it's very almost collage, uh, people living together, and we didn't have clean ethnically area. And if you look uh, down the ethnic picture of Bosnia and Herzegovina after the war, you can see how the war actions had enormous impact on ethnic distribution in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Please, next. I think it's very important uh, because usually when we're just talking about it or just uh, showing the, the statistic without seeing the picture, so, you know, we cannot the gasp over the, the, the impact and what that means. And here is ethnic distribution 2013 because uh, the politically, unfortunately, uh, we have seen that politicians continue to have the actions of ethnic cleansing even after the war because they have idea that uh, a certain area had, uh, it, uh, are the part of the plan how to split the state. So uh, the, the, the yellow, uh, yellow um, uh, area there are uh, today uh, mostly inhabited by uh, Bosnian Orthodox Serbs. The green one is Bosnian Muslims uh, Bosniaks and the red one is the Bosnian Catholics or Croats. Next please, thank you. So, victims. As I said, we have huge disparity between the number of population before the war and after the war. So uh, today, Bosnia and Herzegovina is unfortunately on the top of statistics uh, of displaced persons. We have 1.5 million uh, refugees uh, in the world. So 2.5 million displaced, that we're talking about in internally, ex externally uh, refugees. 35,000 victims remain uncounted for, and uh, luckily, uh, not luckily, I mean uh, the Bosnia Herzegovina um, uh, government did, uh, did support the institution of uh, finding the missings that uh, done ex exceptional work. So, uh, per today, there are just 7,000 uh, people that are accounted for. They cannot identify them. Uh, because they don't have uh, DNA to compare with. Between 40 and 50,000 rape victims, an overwhelming majority of those victims being Bosnian Muslims Bosniaks. It's very important to state, unfortunately, we have uh, several different statistics, and we cannot uh, formally uh, say we have uh, 1,000 victims, because uh, testify about rape is is very few who come uh, and testify about it. So that is very difficult to document because we call them uh, silent victims. So according to OSTE report, est uh, uh, they estimate between 20 and 40,000 people, women and men, were raped or sexually abused. So unfortunately, here is very complicated situation because you know even legally, juridically, uh, we have very poor legal protection of witnesses. Because, for instance, if you witness of uh, rape violence during the war, then uh, legally, if you leave or move from one area to another, you're losing all state support. So people are not willingly witness about the sexual violence because they find it very difficult to. I gathered the date uh, by two organizations, Association of Women Victims of War in Bosnia and Herzegovina, who tried to document the rape witnesses and to have the proofs for what we're talking about today. But as I said, it's very difficult to find uh, survivors who are able or willing to, to take this uh, unfortunately fight. So. In the data by Association of Women Victims in War, uh, they uh, gather statements of 2,707 interviews, and their study include both women and males of all nationalities. So, as you can see, uh, as, as I stated earlier, uh, the majority of victims were Bosnian Muslims. But, uh, as I said, uh, the sexual abuse and rape of males is even more difficult to prove because the rape and sexually violence is considered as shame, shameful. 
not just them as a victims, but as well how society around them is going to look upon them. So here we have uh, the, um, the proof that they managed just to find 220 statements from rape males in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And as I said, the most, uh, majority of sexual violence have been done through the concentration camps and prisoners that has been mostly in the area controlled by the Bosnian Serbs and Serbia. This is the data of researcher and journalist Ozran Kebo. He, he claimed that he managed to prove 38,000 victims of sexual violence and rape. And of course, uh, we have many witnesses who are saying that uh, strategic uh, use of sexual violence and rape has been as well uh, done in such way that when they rape women, they will keep them so long in concentration camp that it will not be possible to um, determinate in pregnancy, that they are forced to give birth to children or to child. So just in the area of Srebrenica, Vlasanica, Bratunac, and Zvornik, uh, he managed to, to prove that that was more than 1,000 women and children raped. Unfortunately, he didn't find uh, existence of sexual violence towards me, males, but is not, he's not saying that that is not happening, but unfortunately, he, he couldn't manage to find the proofs. Please, the, the next one. So, consequences of uh, using the rape and sexual violence in the war, and in the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, documented, there is documented 61 children born after the rape and sexual violence in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And of course, 97% of those children has been left uh, in institutions. And um, unfortunately, these days we have that those children is like approximately 20 years old and trying to search for their families. And uh, we have several documentaries who showing the impossible uh, um, destinies of both the children and the parents or mother in that case. So, punishment. As I said, we're talking and we're seeing that sexual violence, rape, is constantly using as a tool in the war strategies. And not just in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but as I mentioned, in Africa and other places. And we still have problems to do something crucial about the issue. And as I said, I'm very happy that I'm seeing now more males here together with us because this is not the, the problem of women, this is really the general problem of all societies, regardless their culture. So, as I said, punishment in case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, as you can see, the ICTY had convicted 42 Serbs, 12 Croats, and four Bosniaks of war crimes. And they indicated three, uh, 93 males, of which 44 were charged with crimes related to sexual violence. So actually, as I said, the, the, the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina was prece precedence in the sense to recognize sexual violence and rape as a crime against humanity. So that is at least a step in the right direction. In case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, have seen the, the Bosnian Serbs and uh, Croats were mostly indicated and convicted of systematic war crimes. Comparing the Bosnian Muslims, where the most indication was done or convicted of individual crimes. So here as well we have the, the disparity between what was strategically used and what was the, the one time or criminal act by one individual. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I would say it makes more sense to hear both presentations and then we shall have a moment for questions and comments. So I would like now to turn to Gorana Ogenovic. So Jasna showed you statistics. As you all know, there is a huge debate about whether what happened in Bosnia was genocide. So I decided to start up with nailing down the facts of why this was a genocide. And why, in addition, uh, also what has been done to women was a genocide. Unfortunately, the international 
legal system is not ready yet to make that decision. We're hoping they'll get up to the task soon. The genocide means essentially systematic elimination of a group. Systematic in the sense that it's strategically planned, it's tactically executed, and leaves more or less no able witnesses to what has been done. Now, of course, we have in the title, it's been said that it was about the Bosnia-Herzegovina. That is where the task has been evilly perfected. The practice of the rape started in Croatia. The practice was uh, executed both in camps and at, at the spot, I mean, in homes, in public spaces. Once the, this group of people who did this thing uh, moved to Bosnia, the rape was primarily, in, in most of the cases, executed in the rape camps. The camps were organized in order for people to get raped, women in particular. Other groups being raped were children, men, elderly. Once these people moved on to Kosovo, which has to be mentioned because it gets such a little recognition, uh, another height of evil was reached. Um, people were surrounded by soldiers in the public places, and the persons, women primarily, who were going to be raped were taken out and raped in front of the entire communities. So, that much for the rape. The killing, the destruction, all that goes into this category of genocidal Acts. Of course, today is 8th of March, and we can wonder why international society is not ready yet to accept the fact that women's bodies were treated as territory, and therefore it should be also recognized as a part of genocide. But international society has also additional problems, and that is that only Srebrenica got the judgment. Only Srebrenica was um, classified as genocide. Isn't that a bit strange? The only men really killed in Srebrenica. So then we can start wondering if the men were systematically raped in the, in the way that women were, kept until they could not have either any form for abortion, would that, that mean that also the, the category of the women's rape would have been a part of genocide? The answer to that, I think, is yes. And then, of course, we had to see uh, what other type of ordinary pictures, ordinary images that Marina was using, you know, these paintings I was trying to get the answers from her about. What was the main motive? Because, you know, this genocide was not only committed by the separatist forces and the special forces, military forces coming from Serbia and doing this. It was committed by neighbors, it was committed by ex-friends, ex-girlfriends, ex-boyfriends. Suddenly, one day, people just woke up and they've been separated in groups, and one group in particular was the target. Uh, so, we have to find the explanation, how did, you know, ordinary Dick and Harry decide one morning to go and just rape somebody? And claim that what they've been doing was for the purpose of defending their own family. So we've been dealing with the notion of politicization of religion. So the religion as a term is finally, you know, entering the door. It has been mentioned implicitly many times today, but now it's like frontal attack on the term. This is not about religion, what I will say. This is about politicization of religion. Because in certain contexts, uh, politization of religion is just means to an end. It's means to achieve political goal. What we would like to argue or present as a possible explanation, one of the many possible explanations, is the fact that religious symbolism, and it's been proven in, in, in the former Yugoslavia during the wars, has been used to motivate people to get up as I said, ordinary Dick and Harry, and one morning just go and do these things. The problem usually when you say stuff like this is that, but was it a switch in their heads? No, there were no switch in their heads. 
you had other people telling them what this is going to be and how it's going to be done. So they had the initiators of the conflict, which unfortunately did not end up in Hague. You have one person in Belgrade today, Vukod Rašković, who has been giving the hate speeches around Bosnia and Croatia. Some 10 years ago, he changed his mind, and now he's talking a different story, and nobody's really telling them anything. He wrote books about explaining what Bosniaks and the Croats will do to these people and so on. Then you have Sheshel, Mr. Sheshel, that was released recently on the condition of illness. He's also guilty of the you know, hate crimes and actual rape, but for the lack of the proof, as they would say in Hague, uh, proof was not good enough. There was a proof, but not as you know, the legislation would like it. He's now uh, competing for being a premier or president of Serbia. That should uh, illustrate what was going on. And the essential problem with this uh, genocidal rape or genocide in itself is that mainly we're talking about the victims. We're not talking about people who did this. Because you can see the numbers of who was raped are tremendous. And they are actually just gray numbers because the numbers are much larger. And then you look at the numbers you know, of, for example, uh, 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 how many separatists were there or you know, how many military forces and how many you know, volunteer soldiers, reserve soldiers. The numbers are very small. One of the problems is that the people who did this are actually today still living where they've been living. They have returned to their ordinary jobs. They have wives, they have families. The scale of domestic violence in Serbia is just going up the roof. But nobody seems to be really kind of connecting the explanations. Because essentially, whoever did this genocide, I mean, whoever in the sense which in individuals did it, what they did not think at the time was that they will actually have to live with what they've done. And essentially, they did it to whom? They did it to their own children, primarily. And then to the victim, and then so on. And then we've come to sort of a, the plan. The plan is for the genocide is something that mainly people don't like to talk about. And there are very good reasons for that. Because if we need to go far back in the European history to kind of find a, a similar plan to eliminate another group. So the plan essentially was carried out by academics in Belgrade and certain people from Bosnian Serb academia. What they've done was that they've actually went into planning on how most effectively they can destroy a group. So they, not, they noted things like certain age, gender, how to sort people out, how to keep them apart, and so on. Killing of the children was also very important. Uh, today, still in Prijedar, the local authorities, which are the Orthodox slash Serb authorities, do not want to admit that everybody knows where are the th around 1,000 children of Bosnian Muslims killed and buried. In the case of Kosovo, for example, the actual bodies of the people killed are not even accessible. So the, the, the message is, if you can't come up with the body, there was no murder. It's like a cheap TV show. Because what's been done is that um, people were killed, They've been loading up, loaded up in trucks, driven out uh, the border from Kosovo to Serbia, and buried in the mass graves in Serbia. So just try and come over and see what is going to happen to you if you start looking for where they are. So that is the category of the missing, mainly. Uh, when I say academics, then we have to stress that there's psychologists, uh, social psychologists, sociologists, uh, political science people, philosophers. Some of them even taught Shakespeare, and then they kill themselves. But that's, that's how the story of the plan went. One of the most grotesque, uh, whenever we taught, uh, grotesque picture of, how, of, of, of what does it mean when we say genocidal rape, there is this picture which presents it in the line of manner. 
So what they've done, is, first they've raped hierarchically, they've raped generations of people. So they would have a grandmother, a mother, uh, daughters, children of the daughters, like that. And then it was also the line of matter. The line of matter was that they would rape people who were related to each other, as a siblings and married to the siblings and siblings' children and so on. Because it's very rare when you come to Bosnia and um, you talk to these people, it's very rare to find families who are not affected. So if you can imagine us sitting in this room today and saying that 99% of the people in this room, their families were the victims of genocidal rape. Can you imagine that? I can, I've been in a room like that. Now of course, the question of the religion is something that even less people want to talk about. So when we nail the genocide, we can nail what does it mean when I talk about the Abrahamic culture. The problem with the people who have been kind of a willing to let themselves go in the sense of being infected by this disease, which means that you have right to do things to women, children, and to whoever you don't need, you think, is the concept of the Abrahamic culture. Now, in the case of Balkans, there are the two um, primary religions that would come under this umbrella of the Abrahamic culture, and that is the Christianity and the Islam. So if we start thinking about how is it that the Abrahamic culture, culture in the sense that you don't have to be religious, but you still follow the code because it's deeply uh, uh, seated in the culture based, as our culture, culture values are actually Abrahamic values with the sources from religious um, understanding of the world, then you're getting also closer to understanding how can people do something like that, and then they can go home and they can hope that they can, you know, be forgiven. So we had then the priests who made that matter kind of a, a bit easier. They, they, they tried to smear the way. So you had, there's a documentation on the YouTube, a lot of documentation showing how the priests were actually blessing the people who did the crimes before them actually doing the crimes. And none of the, um, these people were actually taken to court and sentenced for these crimes. So the symbolism of Abrahamism is a huge issue. It's a basic conflict, it's a huge conflict, and it absolutely has no source in reality how we would like to see it on the 8th of March. Of course, for <laughs> the end, the question was, was the situation any better after the war? The problem is that as, just as, as this uh, narrative of what has been done to Bosnian Muslims in the Second World War, it's kind of repeated itself. So a lot of the stories, a lot of the documentation, a lot of the feelings, experiences are remaining in the so-called uh, private narrative of the private space. And can we blame them? No, we can't blame them. And just don't forget that thousands and thousands of people, as a result of the conflict, left the country. And there is absolutely impossible to document if and how and to what degree they've been the victims of these crimes. The crimes of genocide. Welcome to modernity. Thank you very much. I am sure that is not, it's never easy to narrate this story. I am sure that also for many of you students has not been easy to listen to. But on the other hand, let me tell you this, that it is important, it's a duty to narrate Total Evil. Because you know, Total Evil occurs, and I would like also to underline one sentence that you said, ordinary people. And uh, this is the key to everything. It is crucial for us to understand how it is possible that ordinary people may open the door to Total Evil because it is too easy to speak of outbursts of violence, of bloodthirst or uh, sadism. We shall not yield to this rhetoric of monstrosity because the problem is the total evil can be ordinary. And this is really what we have to understand. And it is not the only instance in which total evil was perpetrated by ordinary people. Obviously, the Shoah is the first. Example comes to our mind. 
uh, but this is also extremely important. So I know that it hasn't been easy, but we do this to try to give how, our however little contribution to make sure that ordinary people won't any longer open the door, their minds and hearts to social media. So thank you very much, because I think that this has been an important moment. I would like now to open the floor for questions and comments. Let me also remind you that the last panel, last but not least, will also be about religion and violence. So also keep some of the ammunition for the last panel. Uh, this topic of the Abrahamic culture will be also again on the floor, but I, I will have myself a lot of points, but I would rather say uh, now the floor is for you. Thank you very much. To more political but difficult question. The first is, uh, I, I, remember, I, I remember that uh, after Dayton uh, agreement, the cleaning of uh, the ethnic clinic continue because the Dayton agreement is true or not, first. And the second, I remember when I, <clears throat> uh, some years uh, after the war, I arrived to um, Sarajevo from Dubrovnik, uh, near the street going to Mezhugorje. There is this very big Catholic uh, crux, crux on the hill. So when I was uh, to visit Mezhugorje, I was asking to me, what influenced Mezhugorje sanctuary during the war? <laughs> OK. <laughs> this too, because and the third question is, uh, about uh, we, violence against women. Because you are so worried about uh, violence against women uh, in Italy. Eh? Uh, but I was, uh, because I, I had some friends, some doctors from the University of Trieste, they worked very much in uh, with uh, people in Sarajevo. And they, they said to me, but not only women, but the, 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 our construction was around the women, crime, crime against women, and uh, the other was silenced. I know that NATO played a big part in helping with this whole, the whole US Afghan crisis post-war. Um, did they do anything in particular to help this whole problem of like rape and genocide? This also because you are also talking the name of the victims, so it's very hard. But my question relates uh, the issue of responsibility, because it's clear when you commit uh, a genocide like in Srebrenica, 7,000 people, uh, there are not only uh, the people directly convicted in the murder, but uh, you have uh, people who gave food to the soldier, people who gave uh, a taxi, I mean a car driver, people who gave uh, host the soldier, people who make graves. And as far as I know, uh, nobody talk about it. Silent victims, but so, uh, silent uh, co-perpetrators, I mean, people who helped. They were, the village, they know all, but they are not saying something. Do you see any possibility just to have the recognition and just to ask, like in uh, South Africa, just to recognize uh, what is done and uh, just to start, uh, I mean, uh, a new beginning uh, in the former Yugoslavia, but because uh, you can start only when you recognize what you have done? First question, date and agreement, definitely. Unfortunately, we have witnessing that international community actually play some experimental game with Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially. And that is uh, my opinion. And after research, doing research in several fields, uh, is actually uh, legally recognition of ethnic cleansing and the war results. Because actually, Dayton Agreement recognize ethnic cleansing as an argument to having territory. Because as we know, they call it Republika Srpska. I have 
problems to say Republika Srpska because that is definitely a result of ethnic cleansing, war crimes, and rape during, during the war. And they have been recognized by giving them autonomy is like unbelievable. But in the same way, we have precedents made in Kosovo or Serbia because then uh, the international commun community is saying that because of Serbia commit genocide on uh, Kosovo Albanians, they don't have right to keep that part of the country. They lost it because of they've been responsible. But at the same time, the international community <laughs> recognized the, the, the war crimes and uh, genocide and giving them autonomy in the Bosnia and Herzegovina. And yes, when you have the constitution of the state that is based of ethnicity and nationality, that is the, unfortunately the recipe of disaster. Because we don't have the state that is based on the laws and um, uh, the citizenship that everybody are, uh, uh, have rights in the state. Because, you know, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have three constituted peoples, Serbs, Croats, and Muslims. We, all others, Bosnians, Yugoslavs, whatever you want to identify yourself, we don't have rights. We are not legally, even legally recognized in the state. So, yes, my answer, unfortunately, because I'm, I'm working on the project, you know, uh, on Dayton Agreement and how we can go away from ethnicity of jurisprudence, you know, we have to do something about it. So second, your second question regarding the cross, uh, I know the cross in Mostar, that is on the way, that is in Herzegovina. And we have a colleague, Ognjenoic and I have been in Mostar on some conference talking about politicization of religion. And one of the participants asked me, can you please explain me uh, what is politicization of religion in, in, in conflict? And I said, my dear friend, look at the cross on the, on the mountain. Uh, this is really unbelievable. Because uh, putting the cross as a symbolism of you know, Christianity, you're actually saying, this is my territory. This is my land, and you don't have anything to do that. Uh, you ask about NATO. And if they did something, you know, the NATO, luckily, yeah, we saying, uh, I remember when I sat in Sarajevo during the start of war, I couldn't believe that nobody is coming to help us because we consider ourselves as European and, uh, you know, urban people. And suddenly you, you wake up and bombs is coming and nobody reacting and people are totally, you know, in the chaos. And you know, we're saying because we grew up in Yugoslavia where the social system teach us that, you know, these uh, world institutions as Red Cross, United Nations, we never allow that we should believe that is very important for the world order that we have these institutions. And we believed it. They are not going to accept this. But unfortunately, all of them, I said, after my experience in the war, I never give money to the Red Cross. I don't trust the United Nations and NATO, uh, okay, uh, maybe I shouldn't because now I'm talking privately, that is not a like, objective academic <laughs> view on that. We know NATO is the new, um, no, imperialist uh, uh, movement, I can say. You know, colonialism. They just go inside of the area that is of the great interest of. That is my private opinion, because unfortunately, United Nations is the organization that should help other countries in the problems, or, or all those military uh, actions as we're seeing in Syria uh, these days, you know. Because I believe that many Syrians are saying, oh, what is happening, why nobody help us? So yes, NATO did help us to some extent, but uh, that cost us very much. And they were as well the part of the huge experiment that international community did with the Bosnia and Herzegovina because multiculturalism, they are not accepting that it's possible that people with different cultural or religious pronunciation can live together. And we 
have proving them wrongly. Yes, we kill each other sometimes, but that is, yeah, seriously, but that is the economy, that is politics, and we are post-socialist country, we are post-transitional country, we are post-post-post, so you know. About Marina's question was that if the focus after the war was to come to reconciliation, then it would have been possible. The problem is that the states have made their goal to uh, actually complete the project of uh, dividing people into ethnically clean um, uh, areas uh, by means that were not anymore, you know, the rape and the killing. So what they did was they focused their institutions, they've informed the international organizations in a way that just accommodated this whole thing. So the latest um, uh, research result which we've had um, is the book that's coming out and about the politicization of religion in the school textbooks. Um, that has just shown us to what degree already children in primary and secondary school are being fed by ideological um, 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 lines of, 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 of thinking about the other, which is not there anymore. Uh, and this is because the, the proof of the segregation after the war increasing only, coming to the level of the apartheid now, uh, is there. You know, the numbers are increasing. Uh, the, the ways of harassing people, making them move out of the country and so on, are just you know, getting smoother and smoother. So the reconciliation by today is still not in anybody's minds in reality, only on the paper, unfortunately. I'm sorry about the NATO question. I found it very interesting. The NATO question was uh, a serious question which I feel needs to be sort of uh, used uh, especially in, in, in a matter of symbolism. Yes, NATO bombed Belgrade. Yes, they stopped them from doing certain kinds of things. But in effect, uh, that bombing has been sublimized into the victimhood uh, one more time. So now, the, this myth of why NATO actually bombed Belgrade have grown and multiplied so many times they don't even know where it begins or where it starts or stops the question about true commission, in possibility of true commission. How is it possible to have true commission when we have, even today, uh, they denying that the genocide find the place? Even in Europe, you have the states who denied that we had the genocide. And not to talk about Serbia, and you cannot start before you recognize the problem. You cannot find solution. One of the problems is also when people start to think about, we, we talk about rape, and then people have ideas, what is rape? In reality, what we don't usually want to talk about uh, is the fact that you know, the people who did these crimes have not been processed. Um, one of the reasons potentially is also what kind of crimes have been carried out. We're talking about mutilation of people's bodies. We're talking about amputations of the organs. We're talking about sticking people on sticks uh, in the central areas of Sarajevo. We're talking about such um, um, evil doings that simply to get the message across, you're trying to kind of avoid to mention the, the grotesque details of what has been done. When such things have been done, the Truth Commission is a bit short, you know, coming. And especially when the people who did it are not processed. And not processed in either respect, either in, in Croatia or in, in Kosovo or in Bosnia. The actual doers, not the commanders. The, the, the commanding staff has been, so to speak, process, but not the actual doers. So the doers are, you know, having a drink at the bar and, you know, taking the airplane ticket to Ireland to, you know, earn some money and so on. Ridiculous, completely, you know, psychedelic, but it's really so. We still have time, I would say, for a couple of questions. I can see there is Marcella Simone, but also besides Marcella, is anyone else willing to ask a question or to make a comment? Um, thank you very much. I, um, I just have, a, a, not a curiosity, but um, a comparative um, question to ask. In other conflicts, I, I work on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and in other conflicts where issues of religion, ethnicity um, are combined in such a deadly way, there have been um, truth and reconciliation commissions that work from below, meaning that they're not um, instituted by the states, or given that there is no peace process really working, but they're work 
network of NGOs which on a voluntary basis promote dialogues between others. So uh, my question is if there's anything like that or uh, at work. Thank you. So one phrase from Gornam, the question is of course also to Yasn. Um, I, I can't exact, it, it's too or, 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 um, horrific for me to think a room where 99% of the population has, has been affected by something like that. So I sort of, what happens to a society? I mean, this is a very, kind of a, very silly question, but that, so what happens to a society that- That's genocide. Uh, that, yes, but- That's what the point of genocide. How do people behave? Uh, what, so can, can you give us some sort of, Example of some sort of so what happens to a society there in which uh, first to answer the first question, yes, we have NGOs who really do excellent work, but unfortunately, I have I, I'm, I, I really trying to be, uh, to be positive. I myself trying to fight against these politics. Unfortunately, we have political decisions that they constantly try to keep people apart, not talking. Because if you have NGOs in the area of, as they call it, federation, they're working exceptionally, and then you have uh, NGOs in the area of Republika Srpska, it's working exceptionally, but they are not allowed to work across. We have some very good NGOs that they criticize, uh, you know, the, the entire political elites, but you know, as I totally agree with you, we have to start uh, with the grassroots. And you have so many people who have been through tremendous, uh, horrific uh, experience. And they saying, I, I don't have hatred for the Serbs or Croats or whatever, because I can distinct between the ordinary people and those who commit these atrocities. But many people can't. But the only thing that they demand is recognition of their suffering. And they are not getting, they, they get re-victimized again. And not, ju by, not just by perpetrators, but international community is really playing a huge part on it. The second, uh, because you know, you're seeing Hutsi, Tutsi, you know, Hutu, Tut, Tutsi in, in, in Rwanda, all, in all conflicts, the first, what they're using, this is ethnicity, and religion. Because I don't know why, but people are so easily to get fired up and prepared to do atrocities in the name of such abstraction as it is God or nation. I, 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 I really study that, I still don't understand, but I will try. So, you're saying what? We are nation of post-traumatic stress, you know, uh, even I, that, not, uh, that I uh, was, uh, didn't spend so long time in war, but for me, like seven months was more than enough. And surviving some terrible stuff that I had to go through, even 25 years after, you know, when I hear some very loud noise, I get like to cover myself. You know, you're thinking this is grenade or bomb. That is society of let, let, lethargy, how lethargic society. People losing uh, optimism because first, just uh, days after the war, everybody was happy and thinking, okay, now we are going to build, now we, you know, because they believe in the judicial system that they will catch the perpetrators. They believe in international community despite that they will do something they believe that is future there, they young, they will do something, and nothing of that happens. And now, these days, with this anti-Islamic politics in the entire world, they now even getting that stamp on their they back, saying that there are, there are possibility for terrorism or to be, you know, Islamic terrorists, and they don't get it. What is, you know, what you're talking about? So, that is society. But we still have, fabulous young people with power and believe in tomorrow. The issue here is not, as in, I, I, I was very clear saying this was not a religious war. 
because the religion was only instrumentalized. You hear us talk, you might conclude that it was the ethnic, you know, somebody's some ethnically religious conflict. Not quite. Essentially, it was a political project. And uh, when we were trying to find examples of what would that mean, that would mean, for example, that uh, crimes against women in particular, at one point, were also committed uh, by the men of their own ethnicity in Bosnia. So they were not like that one group was going and raping the women of the other group. They were also raping the women of their own group. And the reason for this was that they wanted physically to force the people out if they survive the torture, humiliation, and rape, and amputations, and all this. They wanted them never to come back to the certain areas. Therefore, the map where suddenly Bosnia is cleanly divided between the three. So that is then extra kind of a level which, not really, I mean, there are a couple of people who got sentenced in, uh, in Hague for the crimes, but it does not still ring the right proper bell. And that is that they have been systematically doing things to the members of their own groups in order to make them not ever come back to the certain areas. So political is the word, not religious and not ethnic. And it was political from the top down. On the grassroots, e, there was many, 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 many things. Like in any, when somebody switches the light off, it's dark. But from the top down, it was a political, it was elitistic, it was, they will divide Yugoslavia how it suits to them, they will now divide Bosnia how it suits to them, and so on. Because essentially, when you think of Bosnia, people in Bosnia are the Bosnian Catholics, they're not Croats. Uh, so-called Serbs in Bosnia are the Orthodox population of Bosnia, have nothing to do with Serbia. Of course, there are Croats in Bosnia and there are Serbs in Bosnia, but they are in Promils, and there's a small amount of people who at one point or the other moved to Bosnia. But it's been sold as such to legitimize the liquidation of the entire state. Because it's easier, you know. The cleaner it gets, it's easier to handle. That's what people think, but that's not quite so. Because the problems from um, ho being homogenic increasingly after the war and all these years after are now hitting the roof. And they're hitting the roof in the very special manners. We have, f for example, uh, uh, sects which are attempting to use democratic means today in Croatia in order to legislate absolutely totalitarian policies which are in reference to women's bodies. That is when you let somebody be homogenic who doesn't know what it is. <laughs> let me say, Serbia is uh, also another. I mean, in Serbia, the church has gotten hold of the university. Since 2006, the Orthodox Church, the Serbian Orthodox Church is running the university. Can you imagine that just they come and run university? Anybody who was the opposition in Serbia left they just simply left because it's the, the amount of the homogenic um, you know, hormones, as I call them, they are the source of something not very pretty. But you know, you voted, you got them, you ordered, you listened to orders, you executed, and now you're leaving it. And that is what nobody of them really thought of. What's coming after? It was just, what are we gonna do now? And the light is on again. John, again, I think you know now we also have to leave the uh, light to the last but not least panel, uh, in which actually some of the topics that were brought up today will be further, I mean today, in this session will be further discussed. Um, I also think that perhaps it can be in order to have a short, short break, eh? but I would like just to take one more second to highlight one of the sentences that you said before, welcome to modernity. And you see, I mean, my students tomorrow in class, we have to uh, talk about the, the text of Bartolomé de las Casas, because tomorrow there is a class. Bartolomé de las Casas and actually, you know, this genocide that was at the very root, you know, of Western political modernity, because each time we start framing Western modernity, we must remember that it was born twin 
uh, with this first genocide that was the genocide of Caribbean and Latin America. And so we have, I would say, in this first two thirds of the day, we have learned some two very important points about modernity. One is somehow the original expropriation that was made of women bodies and women liberty that is not an accident but is constitutive of political modernity. And second, the dark side that is the planning for genocide and the conscious reflexive possibility of erasing as Anna Arendt said, no, a group of people from the face of the earth. These are not accidents, these are not pebbles in the shoes of modernity, and as we are sons and daughters of modernity, that's why it is so important to understand why and how. So I would like to really thank our presenters this afternoon for being with us. I would like also to thank you for your participation, and we shall now have a short break and at 3.30, super sharp. Let's Let's say 328. We are back in this room for, this, for the last session. Thank you very much.